Hello and welcome again, everybody. This is our last session of this month's installment of the Digital Health Series. Thank you all for joining us. Our panel topic is titled, or our panel is titled Meeting Interoperability and Federal Data Sharing Requirements. And we sure do have a power panel of interoperability experts, and we're so excited to have them all join us today. Before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to our session sponsors, Informatics and MuleSoft, MuleSoft, which is part of Salesforce. Thank you all for making this session possible. You can check out information both on the website as well as all of our other sponsoring companies. And just a quick reminder, there are three ways for you to ask questions. First and foremost, open your chat box. I'll be putting some fun stuff in the chat box. I want to make sure that you see it and you're able to respond to it. Um, and then um, also make sure when you're chatting that you click that you want to chat to the and the attendees so that all of the attendees see your response. So again, open up that chat box and make sure you're set to respond to all panelists and attendees. Um, all right, so the other way that you can, or the ways you can ask questions, you can ask them in the chat box, you can put them in the queue. So we have this really cool feature now where you can ask questions live. To ask your questions live, hit the hand button at the bottom of your screen, and I'll make sure to call on you during the Q&A portion of the program. Before we get started, I just wanted to double check, Dr. Lane, hear us, and can we hear you? Dr. Lane, back some technical issues. David, when we switch over to do the panel intros, let's go with Dr. Lane last and back in. Okay. Um, all right. So with that, um, we are going to go ahead and get started. And Dr. Lane, um, if you can still be muted by Zoom. Okay. Hey, Doc, do me a favor. Call me back on the cell phone number that I gave you, and we're going to do this the old-fashioned way. I'm going to put my cell phone next to my computer speaker, and you guys can hear Dr. Lane that way, and you guys can <laughs> image on the screen. So, <laughs> all right. Um, Interoperability. Uh, I get that going. Uh, welcome, David Rass, moderator. Turn it over to David, and he's going to get all the list introduced. Okay, great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, before we get started on the um, diving into some further issues today, let's go around and just have everybody introduce themselves briefly and their relationships to uh, interoperability issues. Let's start with Sean Kennedy. Great. Thanks, David. And uh, really thrilled to have the opportunity to join the discussion today. Um, I've been in the health IT since my career started in the military 20 plus years ago. Uh, the last 10 years, I've been a heavy focus on interoperability, having led a number of early interoperability projects at Mass General Hospital here in Boston, then leading the state HIE program in Massachusetts. Now at Salesforce, who acquired MuleSoft about a year and a half ago, I lead our interoperability efforts across healthcare and life sciences. And last year, rapidly expanded into public health space, given our heavy contact tracing and now vaccine management work that requires integrations to ELRs and uh, immunization registries. So uh, look forward to the conversation. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, Mark Savage. Good morning, and thanks very much for the invitation to be with you. Mark Savage, I'm the Director of Health Policy at UC San Francisco's Center for Digital Health Innovation where interoperability is one of my key uh, responsibilities. Um, other things uh, about interoperability, I was recently asked to sit on the uh, US Core Data for Interoperability Task Force, uh, actually on numerous task force for the HIT Advisory Committee and Policy Committee, co-chaired NQF's uh, Interoperability Committee for Interoperability Measurement, sit on the Fire at Scale Task Force, both the Ecosystem Use Case Tiger Team and the Executive Steering Committee the FDA software pre-certification program, um, a variety of things. Thanks so much. Great. Uh, uh, Richard Kramer. Oh, thank you, David. Uh, my name is Richard Kramer. I am the chief healthcare strategist with Informatica. And I have been in healthcare now for about 25 years and also involved with interoperability essentially the entire time uh, back from my time at uh, University of Pennsylvania Health System, working with David Chulkin in the earliest days of health and disease management to working in Massachusetts at UMass Memorial, and, and really on the practical side of interoperability at an academic medical center, how do you make it work? And it's really fun seeing the evolution from when we didn't have standards or technology to now where we have standards, technology, and regulation, and really excited about the opportunity to chat with everybody today. Great. Uh, Jamie Bland. 
Jamie Bland, I'm president and CEO of Sync Health, which is the Nebraska Health Information Exchange, the PDMP, or what we refer to as the health data utility for uh, Nebraska. We work, work across both public health, uh, Medicaid, and the private sector hospital systems and various uh, other stakeholders in that realm, including long-term post-acute private practices, that kind of thing. We also operate the Health Information Exchange in Iowa and have a close partnership with public health and Medicaid on that side as well. Um, we're also the found, one of the founding members of the Consortium for State and Regional Interoperability, which it was a six health information exchange organization group that came together over COVID related work and um, uh, work in the academic space with our collaborative partners on the Nebraska side as well. Great, thanks. Now, do we have uh, Dr. Stephen Lane from Sutter on the call? We do. Dr. Lane, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Fabulous, fabulous. So, uh, so I'm Stephen Lane. I'm a practicing primary care physician at Sutter Health in Northern California, where I've been a clinical informaticist for about 30 years. Uh, initially, on health records, really over the past 15 years, focused primarily on interoperability as well as health information privacy and security. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be involved in a number of interoperability initiatives, both regionally and nationally. I sit on the ONC's Health IT Advisory Committee. Uh, I'm currently co-chairing the, the USCDI task force that, that Mark is serving on. I'm also the uh, chair of the board of the Sequoia Project, the chair of the steering committee at Care Equality, have been involved in a, a number of other initiatives through uh, HL7, Direct Trust, uh, et cetera, in the interoperability space and have very much been involved in uh, work with both the, the development and the local implementation of the new rules out of HHS. So looking forward to the discussion. Great. So I'm going to start by um, bringing up different topics. I'll direct it to one of you, but, ev but after that person's done talking, everybody else can feel free to, I'm going to open it up and people can chime in. So. The first thing I thought we could talk about is uh, maybe some of the interoperability shortcomings we saw during the pandemic response and maybe uh, you know, between health systems and public health entities and whether there are some encouraging signs of progress. For instance, have the HIEs been able to step up and play a key role in some states? So I was gonna start that question off at Jamie and then others can maybe weigh in. So um, HIEs that have close state relationships definitely prospered during COVID. Um, there were public health relationships, data sharing agreements in place, and in many of those cases, robust HIEs that have been in place for more than a decade. I think if we go back and look at what uh, states really excelled in, in getting the data back to providers, those would be the states that really shined. Um, and, and the six HIEs that we work with underneath the consortium are part of that group that really were able to step up uh, from an HIE perspective. Dr. Lane, do you wanna talk about some of the work Sutter's done in California with electronic case reporting? No, oh, I'd love to, thank you. I think there's been you know, tremendous progress made providing public health interoperability over the course of the past year. Um, electronic case reporting is one example of that. Um, that is data go from providers to public health entities. Uh, the good news is right as the pandemic hit us, we were at the end of a pilot process with uh, the Digital Bridge Project, which, which utilized direct messaging and a standard CDA document type to send case reports to public health. That had been stood up in a few small, uh, smallish organizations uh, and we quickly pivoted to focus on COVID-19 reporting and were able to reach our vendors with organizations in the APHL to really get up and running. So that was spread very quickly across California, the country. It also really advanced to uh, go beyond the use of uh, CDA documents via direct to leverage the eHealth Change Hub, uh, and now our vendor implemented a fire-based version of electronic case reporting. So that that has really made dramatic progress. I think there's a lot of hope that that will continue to grow, not only to support pandemic but other uh, reportable 
bank conditions and to automate a process that has for decades been really problematic. I think, you know, that's just one example of, of supporting wider public health interoperability. But, but I just wanted to mention also that within care equality, we have stood up the ability for public health uh, entity provider organizations for data. So it's great when providers can push data to public health, but obviously public health, when they're doing case investigation and epidemiologic uh, analysis, there is often a need to get additional data that does not come through ECR, ELR, or other established methods. Um, a lot of requests from public health really demands for new types of data, novel data structures. Uh, so I think the ability for public health to be able to query providers using the care quality framework is really a step forward. And it's something that has just uh, recently gone live in a, in a second public health jurisdiction and we're working on moving towards that in California also. Great. Anybody else want to jump in with issues that were they've the pandemic has made obvious about public health interoperability issues or or well yeah one of one of the things that we saw David uh, and you know certainly COVID related and I would expect that it uh, impacted on the things that were already discussed but some very pragmatic things like contact information and address information right, and, and the data quality issues that we sort of known about but didn't really have to address and COVID brought into acute focus, right? When you wanna be able to reach out and it was employees, it was members, it was patients, it was community folks. And so just those data quality issues really raised themselves up and became very important to resolve. Uh, and we saw that as a, you know, a very you know, quick impact in, in the COVID response. Yeah. I can add a couple of things from UCSF's perspective. Um, one of the things is we've set up an, a health equity dashboard alongside um, the assessment of bad usage, a lot of blogging by Dr. Walker out of UCSF. Um, but, we've, but we've specifically focused on health equity, both for um, making sure that testing is going out in an equitable manner, also that vaccination is, is going out in an equitable manner. And one of the issues we're also finding is that, um, is the, especially with virtual care, the importance of social determinants of health. I may have something more to say about that later. Yeah. Um, and the absence of that information from the data flow is, is especially in, the, in COVID-19, is having a tremendous impact, as I think we all appreciate. Yeah. Thank you. you know, the only other thing I'll add is the, uh, the delays that we saw in the information coming in from the EHRs into the immunization systems and into ultimately the tracing systems. As you can imagine, contact tracers rely on information to come in and actually do their job very quickly. But if the data is coming in that's 48, 72 hours old, um, that doesn't work well when you're talking about infectious diseases so, or uh, viruses. So that was certainly something that we saw as a bit of an issue. And one of the things that we saw, going back to Richard, your comment around the lack of contact information, one of the use cases we saw a bit about was uh, public health agencies actually trying to work with HIEs to get the contact information, which ended up being a really great use case, albeit a fairly straightforward one. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch topics a little bit and start with Dr. Lane. I know that you're on the ONC Health IT Advisory Committee. We've got a new national coordinator for health IT and Mickey Tripathi. Wanted to know if he's giving any signals of the directions he wants to take ONC and are there priorities that you'd like to see it take related to interoperability issues? And we'll, again, we'll throw that open to others after, after you speak. Yeah, um, Mickey hasn't had a chance to give a lot of public uh, presentations yet. I mean, I think he's still getting his, his feet on the ground. Mickey is well known in uh, interoperability circles. He's, he's been involved in all of the major initiatives and has one of them. Um, so I think that, that he is definitely going to be well positioned to our work in interoperability. Uh, he did come speak to our advisory committee when we weeks ago uh, and said that you know, his top three priorities are COVID. Uh, so that uh, I think that there is going to be a focus in that um, and uh, we're hoping to see, see some real movement. There are certainly some great opportunities there. Uh, in terms, you know, I think the other thing is, is equity, uh, you know, both equity 
regard to health care data uh, and assuring that we are meeting population uh, and social data, race and ethnicity. Uh, important that that information collected is shared and is utilized to to inform our work. So I, I anticipate the priorities going forward. Okay. Anybody else have a have a wish list for Nikki Tripathi at ONC? They want to mention. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly chime in if I could. I'll say I, I, I know Mickey from Massachusetts and I work up on the Mass Highway and uh, he's phenomenal. It's such a well-earned place for him to serve as our ONC. Um, and I'd say it's safe to say that APIs and FIRE have a safe uh, future with him, given his, uh, his real interest in doubling down on that. Um, you know, one of the things I think that's going to be really interesting, and, and I know we'll get more into this, is really being able to strengthen our public health uh, IT infrastructure. You know, we know that the, the budget for public health, I think in 2019 was somewhere around $94 billion. You contrast that with the, what is it, around $28 billion that we spent on meaningful use to adapt, to uh, implement, adopt, and use EHRs. Um, I think there's, a, there's something there. And we need strong leadership to be able to support that tight coupling of health IT, public health IT, if we really get to that place we want to get to, where we've got a world where we can better predict and take action on these threats uh, that really threaten our health. So I'm, I'm optimistic that's going to be a place we'll spend some time. Anybody else? I also think there's a place for uh, ONC to start working on what do the data standards look like for a vaccine credential, if that's what is going to happen in the future. So some priorities for that tangential to COVID. Great. I'll, I'll throw out something. It's, Go ahead, Mark. Throw out something. It's, it's not a wish list, but uh, but perhaps a a, uh, a recommendation to to dust off the interoperability roadmap for 2015 to 2025, um, because there's a lot in there uh, that I think is still useful. You know, High Tech Act in 2009 said one of the core reasons back then was to was to be prepared for infectious diseases but here we are with COVID-19 and we realize that there's a that that time for preparation um, we, there's more to be done and I think that interoperability roadmap uh, has some good things to to look at some he won't he won't need some he might find um, useful Karen DeSalvo and I did a blog uh, I guess it's 2019 now asking um, Here's the interoperability roadmap. Are we halfway there yet? <laughs> and the conclusion was we still have some ways to go. So I think that'd be good reading for Mickey. Okay. I also think there's a lot of lessons learned around what the interoperability. Sorry. Go oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Go. go ahead. Finish up, Lisa, and then Dr. Lane will get to you. Sorry about that. Um, I think the interoperability challenges that were experienced in the early days of COVID with some of the data not being shared. There's a lot of information around what is um, what is data blocking perceived or material um, that can be extracted from the first few months. There was a lot of data not flowing in the initial days uh, because there was information blocking happening. Um, for example, because entities were not public health authorities or designated public health authorities, despite governors and health HHS secretaries asking for this data to be shared by the labs, they wouldn't share the data. So I think that's a significant uh, development that we need to understand from an interoperability perspective and what the rules actually mean. Okay, so Dr. Lane, did you have one more thing you wanted to chime in there? Yeah. I did, uh, just in terms of the ONC priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought Jamie might mention this. I mean, I really put uh, some significant energy and some dollars uh, into supporting HIEs and evolving their capabilities, uh, especially in the context of the pandemic. And I think one thing that we really could use in this country is more standardization of what will be the role of the HIEs. Um, I think, you know, in different parts of the country, HIE capabilities are quite d different. Uh, and th those areas that enjoy a really robust HIE connectivity and broad really have been able to leverage that in the context of the pandemic. And those without that have, have perhaps been somewhat left behind or, or left to come up with other solutions. So I think some, some identification of best practices and promulgation of those all of the states and territories would be really helpful. Yeah, okay, well, 
Yeah. And well, David, I, did, I have one comment just to add to what everybody else has yeah. said. Uh, and, and, you know, from my perspective as a data person and an interoperability person is stay the course, right? Every time one of these new regulations comes up, the industry just protests. And I think we just, it, it's, it's learned behavior, right? We just protest any change. And the thing that's so exciting now with the technologies that are available, and I know Sean feels the same way, is if there is a data sharing requirement from a technology perspective, it is incredibly straightforward to implement it quickly, safely, and securely. And so the opportunity to really reduce the time frame between policy and implementation, particularly in a crisis, has never had what we have today for interoperability. Well, that's funny because that was kind of going to be my next question to, directed at you was these information blocking rules and data sharing requirements for payers and providers using APIs. Is it providing a lot of impetus for these health systems and the payers to transform their data infrastructure and culture with more of an emphasis on data sharing? And I'm wondering what you're hearing from customers about that. So the short answer is yes, but it really is the, the interoperability rules are just adding a very direct focus on what organizations have been doing around data management you know, for the last five years or so, right? There really has been the growth and emergence of the chief data officer in healthcare organizations. And their job really is to manage data as an enterprise asset. And so the investments that people have been making in that where is my data? What does it mean? You know, the governance aspects, being able to provide transparency and lineage of what data goes where and all those things. Those capabilities that people have been working on are fundamental and integral to being able to implement an interoperability solution, right? And, and so there are organizations that aren't quite so mature that think simply putting an API on the front of all of their existing data infrastructure is adequate. And they get started down that path. And we talk to a lot of these people. I mean, I have the best job at Informatica because I spend 100% of my time talking to executives about data in healthcare. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, <laughs> but the minute they start, you know, it goes back to some of the data quality rules and the contact information. The minute you start really digging into the data, right? And interoperability by and large is asking organizations to share data for a different purpose than what the data was created for. And so you realize that, hey, we fixed some of our data issues for how we use it, but now if I'm gonna share it and comply with the standards, I need to fix issues that I haven't fixed before. So it really is, it's a great focus. And if you do data management well, the interoperability is just another recipient of the data that you're already managing well and you understand. If your data management house isn't quite well in order, then interoperability is a scary thing. And so we do see it being an impetus in that area. Okay. Um, Mark, let me turn to Mark. Uh, you co-authored a paper in Health Affairs and noted that although many parts of the new ONC interoperability rules don't go into effect for quite a while, 24 to 36 months, that it's important to start measuring now to establish a baseline. Can you talk about why that's important and, and what they should be measuring? Sure. So after the rules came out, both ONC and CMS, uh, I wrote an article with Julie Adler, Milstein, and Aaron Einstein at UCSF on why, why we should begin measuring now. Um, regulations fundamentally are about um, behavior change towards policy objectives, and these regulations do take a, a, a major leap forward. But we need to, to know whether they are actually achieving their goals, whether they're not achieving their goals. And, and the way we know is, by, is again, by, by measurement. How do we spot gaps? How do we even catch that there needs to be a mid-course correction between where we are now and where we think we're supposed to be once those regulations go into effect as people begin, uh, begin implementing? Some, some examples that might, uh, might bring this home. Take COVID-19, for example. We started measuring immediately about the availability of beds. We didn't wait. We needed to know because we needed to actually know before we were, we were at capacity. And we measured at, here at UCSF, for example, we're measuring the disparities in testing and vaccination because we need to know now in order to make sure that we've got equitable distribution. Um, you see a similar 
point in climate change. We've got goals that are out in the future, but we need to begin measuring now. So we have a baseline. We know what the trends are. And specifically with interoperability, we're talking about pro the progress towards access with fire APIs. Um, there's a variety of problems that can, can emerge. So you may have your fire API, but maybe it's not turned on, or maybe it's turned on, but it's not working. Or maybe there's some preference for proprietary APIs rather than standardized fire-based APIs. You don't discover these things until you start measuring, and we need to measure now so that we are solving as much of the problems as we can before we get to the, the implementation date. Give you one other example. With write access, that was one of the things that we recommended um, that ONC needed to be able to measure. And write access means the ability to write data back into the electronic health record in some way. It might be a separate database. It might be the electronic health record. Very important for bidirectional interoperability, multidirectional um, interoperability. ONC's rules and CMS's rules do not require write access. But there are, uh, in a survey that um, my colleagues and I did at UCSF back at the end of 2018, seven of eight health systems already had some strategy for write access in different ways in place at the end of 2018, before any of this goes into effect. If we measure now, we begin to understand, we can help ONC, for example, understand that there's much more demand, much more robust need, and it's okay to begin requiring write access now. Okay, great. Um, well, while we're talking about APIs, I want to turn to Sean. Um, <laughs> I see Stephen's hand raised. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to chime in on the measurement topic because I think it's so important. And Mark, I really applaud you guys for, for putting that out there. But I've been working with Julia Ather Milstein as, as well as folks at ONC and at HIMSS around the issue of interoperability measurement for years. And some of the real challenges are that it's just really hard to measure. It's hard to know what you're measuring, that the systems do not all facilitate measurement uh, in the same way or, or sometimes in any way. It's very, it, it, sometimes it, it's relatively straightforward to measure the, the movement of CDA documents, but it's much harder to measure uh, how much data is moving uh, with, with APIs. There, there's a real need, uh, and again, people are attending uh, in a number of areas, the real need to really define how we're so that we can do that baseline measurement and track it over. So that, that's a non non problem. It's not just figuring out how to do it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let me turn to Sean. We're talking about APIs here. And as, as they become more critical to health data instead of people writing custom interfaces, what are some of the things that health system CIOs need to understand about managing the life cycle of APIs? Uh, what And what might it enable in terms of data sharing? Uh, in terms of population health or value-based care efforts? Sure, sure, yeah, no, that's a great question. I look forward to it. And, and I just, again, I want to applaud Mark for the work you guys did as well. We, we always thought the idea of measuring transactions is one thing, but measuring the impact of those transactions is something entirely different. And that's, that's super difficult to do. Um, so on the API stuff, you know, I go back and I look at 21st century cures and this, this, this one seemingly simple statement in there of having to implement APIs without special effort. And it's really spawned a range of requirements that is fast kind of pressing an API enabled healthcare ecosystem. And it's super cool, but it comes with this caution that these doors into your IT infrastructure really need to be managed. And so David, getting to your, your question there, um, we know that APIs need to be certified for providers. They need to be conformant by payers, but they also need to be designed, deployed, secured. We got to manage access to them. Ultimately, we got to be able to sunset, sunset them when that time comes. So I think some of the questions I may offer to folks to ask themselves would be things like, you know, how do you plan to secure your APIs? Um, how you apply existing or create new security policies to your APIs, um, how you provision access for your users, payers, patients, other providers, uh, your partners. Um, do you intend to group APIs as, as products or maybe a series of microservices to enable app development? Um, do you intend to monitor and analyze your traffic and gain insight into the performance of the APIs, track their usage, 
identify errors? And these are all really important questions to ask and understand before really launching that first API, because the API-based exchange, while it holds a lot of promise, it certainly comes with a significant responsibility to make sure that we can move that data around safely, securely uh, to preserve the um, for our patients. Okay, great. Anybody want to weigh in? Uh, at the risk of introducing a, a fun healthcare topic, but I think it's very much on point with, with Sean's discussion is API, you know, and again, I'm, a, I'm an antiquated HIE interoperability person where I would always be concerned about an API providing direct access to an application that was never built for external demand, right? And it would all be about performance and the evils of what it's gonna do to my internal users. Well, the topic that's interesting is cloud, right? And I think cloud has an enormous opportunity to play in interoperability because if your applications are in the cloud, you put an API on them and scalability just sort of happens, right? And, and so again, the flexibility to respond to new workloads and do new things with data in an interoperability context. In the old days, we would spend literally years architecting for performance. And the new modern architecture say, we really don't have to worry about that. Let's worry about getting to value rather than worrying for years about architecture. So just you know, a little bit of perspective to add to what Sean said. Okay, great. Let me uh, turn, let's talk about the health information exchange landscape a little bit. And Jamie, uh, we've seen so many mergers in the last just couple of months between health information, information exchange organizations. You mentioned this consortia consortium of six different organizations. Can you talk about some of the impetus that's causing that? What, and maybe HIEs are starting to offer new services. Could you talk about some of the new services they're offering and how, these, how both of these developments might relate to uh, TEFCA and what's coming from Washington in that regard? So I would say just TEFCA broadly, we'll wait to see if there's any rules propagated around it. I don't really have no opinion other than that. Um, the consolidation in the HIE market, I think, is what, you know, Dr. Lane alluded to earlier is that the funding has been really unstable for HIEs for the entire um, decade that I've been really working in the HIE or using the HIE as a provider. Um, and, and that needs to be clarified. How is that going forward? There's obviously a use case for HIE um, in public health and um, connectedness and the ecosystem and last mile of interoperability and all those things that HIEs can do and support in a state, the true query component can be done in many in many places, right? So I think that clarity from uh, CMS and ONC is needed. Um, it's not necessarily understood how that's going forward, which has resulted in a number of the mergers. The consortia that has um, emerged of which we're a part of is uh, really focusing on these public health use cases and this concept of a health data utility and that it's more than clinical data. You know, as, when I was introducing myself, I explained that we host the PDMP. We host a number of public health applications. We are the contact tracing host, uh, you know, working with Salesforce and the Department of Health in Nebraska to roll out that application because we built that on our demographics database and using that information, leveraging that through, um, you know, our, our decade of existence and growing that piece of it. So when that information was needed, we were the source of that information and it grew from there. So I think there's multiple use cases, um, but I think HIE is largely understood in that whole, um, what is an HIE? What are the standards? What do they need to do? Those are things that could be clarified by ONC and help the um, understanding of what the future is. And I think it's a bit ambiguous right now. Yeah. Well, does anyone else want to weigh in on TEFCA, what they've seen so far and, and what its goals are and what the approach has been in their early uh, descriptions? Yeah, I, I can ahead, if you want. Um, so, you know, again, where I, where I sit working with folks at ONC, I've already been pretty much involved in, you know, their vision of TEFCA and helping to craft that and then sitting over with Sequoia and Care Quality, uh, you know, serving as, as the RCE, you know, getting a glimpse at how that is moving forward. I mean, I think TEFCA is a very exciting concept. I do hope that it continues to move forward. You know, the idea of a single on-ramp, as Genevieve put it, uh, that, that will allow connectivity uh, 
to move forward across multiple stakeholders for multiple use cases is really, I think, what, what we all want. Um, I think, you know, back, back to the first question about ONC and Mickey's direction, I think we're, you know, it, it's kind of a bit of an open question. You know, will ONC maintain its commitment to TEFCA? It was clearly called for in 21st Century Cures, and a lot of work has been done over the past couple of years, uh, but, but we need to uh, be clear about how that's going to move forward. The other thing is that in the early work between ONC and the RCE, the focus has really been on document-based exchange, which makes made sense initially, you know, it's what we know well and, and we can build on that. Uh, but of course, you know, there, there's, there's so much more happening now and fire has been accelerating and the, the need for push notifications uh, that, uh, that are being, now being required by CMS. I think there is opportunity to put potentially revisit the scope, the rate of change, uh, what the initial focus is going to be. Obviously, the pandemic has provided plenty of reasons to think that having some or all of TEFCA up even more quickly than had been planned, potentially having participation uh, be required for certain stakeholders as opposed to just being optional. There, there's, there's a lot there that I hope we'll see clarified over the next months. Anybody David, I'd throw out just one, one additional observation, um, which we shared with ONC back in a comment letter. The, we suggested that they require, in TEFCA, that they require the HENS and the, and the QHENS to have a fire, the same fire-based API as a part of the network. They might have that on their own, but we said, you, you really want these to be interconnected interoperability networks. And it um, is a puzzle to me why that wasn't specified as a as a requirement. It it makes it look like two parallel networks, and that um, that seems like a a significant question to me. Mm. Okay, Mark, could you talk a little bit about the U.S. core data for interoperability and the as well as maybe some of the importance of having structured data elements for social determinants uh, and and how that ties into the work of the Gravity Project, maybe. Sure, that's just a small question. <laughs> um, so US core data for interoperability, um, for those who don't know quickly, it's, uh, it was formerly called the common clinical data set. And it was just that set of, of structured data that had to be exchanged um, nationwide with interoperable health information exchange. Um, patients had access to it. It was in referrals. It was in transitions of care and continues to be. Um, uh, from the thousands of potential data elements that could be included, though, the current U.S. CDI only has a small fraction of them, and that's work that Stephen and I and others, and actually the, the public at large, since the public at large is able to provide public comment, are working on to provide information to ONC about what about what to include. So some examples. So what's, what's in um, name, birth sex, vital signs, medications, health concerns, but things that are missing uh, critical things, um, things like that are basic, like pregnancy status, health insurance status, gender identity, those are not included. And data elements that are important to know for care, things like are missing, things like advanced directives, uh, patient and provider goals, cognitive and functional status. Clearly, there's a range of things that, that we need to have as structured data for purposes of nationwide interoperability and understanding what you know how to treat people anytime anywhere and they're and they're missing so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly pivot to the second part of your question which is social determinants of, of health um, according to the research uh, social determinants of health account for 85 to 90 percent of one's health status uh, 80 to 90 percent of health status what happens in the clinical care setting only about 20 percent 15 to 20 20 percent. So if you want to improve health outcomes, if you want to uh, move closer to value-based care, it's critical to integrate information about social determinants of, of health, and COVID-19 certainly has made, that, has made that clear. Yet, unfortunately, social determinants of health data is not included in the US CDI. Um, so, brings me to the Gravity Project. Uh, we, uh, we are a nationwide public collaborative uh, working to try to create standardized, structured uh, data elements for social determinants of health. 
uh, get them uh, build a fire implementation guide that allows them to be referenced, the, the, the code systems and the value sets to be referenced and exchanged through the fire APIs v4 for, um, for, for care. Um, we have at the last count about 1500 members in our public collaborative. These are subject matter experts in the particular domains that we're looking at. And we're, we have a, a long list of domains uh, first ones we started off with food insecurity, housing instability, homelessness, transportation insecurity. We're now pivoting to uh, financial hardship, uh, financial strain, material hardship, interpersonal violence, just a variety of things that we're that we're looking at. We we look at the existing screening tools uh, for diagnosis, assessment, interventions. We look for gaps. The community tells us what they see as missing from based on their experience out, out in the real world. We try to fill those gaps. The, the public collaborative votes on it um, when it's, they think that it's ready to go to the coding steward. So LOINC, SNOBED, ICD can um, to, to be approved and incorporated into the value sets. We're built, we are a fire implementation accelerator project with HL7, so we're work, we just have validated the implementation guide uh, for version one, and that's in, that's in process in order to represent these value sets and make them available for exchange through fire APIs. So um, just think, I'll, 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 one, one point to add. Um, we did submit uh, the first 11 data element the, uh, to, uh, to ONC for inclusion in USCDI uh, draft version two. Unfortunately, it was not in, not included yet. Um, hope that hope that that changes. But the but the work of standardizing is important, and it goes forward whether it's in USCDI or not. Um, the fire fire representation exists whether it goes into USCDI or, or or not. So that work doesn't stop. That work is just as important. But for nationwide interoperability, it would be helpful to get into USCDI. So what's the argument for limiting the number of elements in USCDI? Is it that it would overwhelm developers to try to do too many at once? Um, that, is, that is what uh, ONC said. They wanted to have a conservative incremental approach. They pointed to, uh, pointed to COVID and say, in effect, people's hands are full. And yet, uh, when I talked to uh, doctors at, at UCSF and asked them, I presented them with two use cases around COVID and said, would structured data elements in USCDI make a difference? And they said, absolutely. And so if I presented the results of that in our comment letter to, to ONC that th it's actually hindering the ability to provide care to not have them there. But to your question, that is what they are saying. It's, it's burden, um, but we need them now. <laughs> Uh, Jamie, your organization recently joined the Gravity Pro Project. Can you talk about it from, from your perspective, why it's important and some of the things that your organization is doing around social determinants? Yeah, so we have a technology partner um, that is connecting the community providers. One thing that we, you know, as an organization are to support um, improved health outcomes and the value-based care opportunities in our state and the development moving closer to value-based care um, across Nebraska and Iowa. So we launched that project last year, uh, Gravity Project and the data standard development for those components. Um, NQF is also involved in that as well as um, the developers of the prepare template and rolling that out across a state, across several state um, initiatives actually. So that's how we're involved. Um, so we work very closely with Gravity. Okay, great. Um, here's one for Dr. Lane. Uh, the ONC's regulations adopt a fire bulk data standard that all certified EHR technology must meet. Does this hold real significant potential to advance population and public health? And what are some issues being worked through in, in that realm? Yeah, there's no question that uh, the ability to use the fire uh, data and transport standards to share bulk data is going to be very powerful. Um, and having that embedded in regulations, both you know from the ONC and the CMS side, I think is really going to help move the industry forward. Uh, you know, today there are so many different ways by which data is exchanged between, especially providers and payers, when you're looking at population health, and of course with public health as well. Uh, 
I do think that the, the advancement of the bulk fire standard is going to support many of those use cases. The challenge is really, you know, getting people on board, getting it, you know, out of the connectathons and in real life usage. Um, as Richard was saying, I mean, all you have to do is require it, you know, just find some little requirement and, and make it so. I mean, I think the, the CMS rules uh, years is really going to be one of those big levers that's going to bring a huge swath of our industry on board with fire, forcing them to stand up the infrastructure or partner with who have the infrastructure to be able to do that. We really want to want to build on uh, as those uh, requirements come online. Anybody yeah. else? Want to Just to, to touch on that, Dr. Lane, data blocking is a real thing, right? It is never, I mean, for the recent history, it has not been a technology limitation. It has been an intentional thing. And so the rules that will, you know, help knock down the barriers to data blocking are going to liberate data for a lot of beneficial purposes. Data blocking is innovation blocking. Yeah, no, literally. And it's an intentional act. I mean, I remember uh, I had the opportunity to testify at, a, at an ONC hearing, you know, eight or nine years ago about, you know, the obstinance of the vendor community for not actually being interoperable. And, you know, I, I'm glad we're getting closer, but I didn't think it was going to take us 10 years to fix it. Well, let me, let me continue with you there. Do you think we're going to see a robust like third party app ecosystem develop because of the, these APIs? Are there or are there other issues that have to be worked through privacy and consent? Issues? I am desperately hopeful that there is going to be a third party. Everybody there? Yeah. Yes. You for a Need that got lost? I think his picture froze. Oh, yeah, there, there you are. There you are. are. You're about there, Richard. I was wondering if it was with everybody else. <laughs> so uh, I was saying I'm desperately hopeful that there will be rampant innovation, right? The, the This data has been there. It has been a Trevor trove of potential energy and value, but it's been locked behind, you know, people claiming ownership or using HIPAA as an excuse not to share it. And, and I look and I say, you know, the consent management rule uh, component that says, hey, the patient or the member is the one who owns this data, you don't, and you must give it to a third party if they want to do it. And, and I think we're going to see all of those customer and patient engagement, all of those cool things and potentials to do with data are going to be unleashed by this third party group of developers, because mm -hmm. there's so much innovation that healthcare has desperately been lacking. You know, that will be consumer friendly, patient friendly, and, and help all of us. So I'm very, very hopeful. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree, Thank Richard. You. I think that's a, a great point. I'd say another interesting topic or point around that is I actually partook in the uh, eHealth Initiatives Data Privacy Work Group on this topic. And I think the thing to remember about these consumer based apps is that they operate outside of the scope of HIPAA. Right. So how do you get those developers to align to HIPAA and the industry's interest in what the app developers um, kind of do with the data that they get? And right now, really, it's just the, the FTC is what we're seeing is really the governing body to enforce the activities uh, of these folks and ensure that the terms and conditions that the uh, consumers sign up for are followed. Um, but, you know, the reality is a lot of consumers don't read those. So one of the ideas that was proposed was to kind of create some form of self-governance and public transparency that encourages the good behavior of these app developers and then publicly shames uh, uh, the bad actors. So uh, I, I've got a lot of optimism for the space, but I think there's, a, there's some things to certainly work out. Yeah, let me chime in there if I may. Uh, you know, I think this notion that the, an app ecosystem will, will evolve to, to address so many of our challenges is something that, that I've been hopeful about for years, and I've really been struck by how slow it's been to start taking off. I mean, Apple Health really unlocked the patient-directed query some years ago now, and, you know, what we've been able to determine, which has been quite limited in our interoperability measurement, is that patients and app developers have taken to that really very slowly. Uh, I think a lot of us expected that to just blow up over the course of the year or so, 
and it really hasn't. If you go to the, the Apple App Store, you know, there really aren't that many apps still to take advantage of that data. Uh, so I think part of it may be the privacy concerns. I think the Karen Alliance and others are doing tremendous work there. Um, but, uh, you know, I think getting the payers on board with, with APIs uh, and, and fire data is, is potentially going to accelerate things. But I continue to be surprised by how slowly this is going. I'll throw out one one uh, observation about that in particular, which is the, um, some of the requirements for getting into an app store are actually barriers to entry for the app developers. And I think there's some work that needs to happen ar around their sort of delays and how long an application is pending before there's a decision. If you're a startup, um, you may not have a whole lot of time to wait before trying to get to trying to get to to get to market. Um, also, our, you know, as an app developer coming in with something where an EHR developer sees that as competing with what they're providing, um, seeing evidence of, of that being a, a barrier. We need more, more management, more, more looking at, at that. Um, I'm not saying that that's the only, the only issue, but I think it is a significant issue in the move towards a robust third-party app ecosystem. And if I could just offer one more comment there, I'll say that as the providers and payers have their patient access APIs become available, they need to watch out because there is a potential they're going to get disintermediated, right? So their member portals, their patient portals, if I get a really cool app that provides a lot of the same services from my portal, I may just start to operate in that app and not use the portal anymore. And now you've lost your digital touch to your patients and your, your members, which would uh, not be welcome for payers or providers. Okay. I think the same could be said from the perspective of EHR companies. Uh, you know, if somebody creates a really cool app or set of apps to meet the needs of a particular segment of the, the clinician or the caregiver population, and then suddenly they don't really need an EHR, uh, that that will also change the marketplace tremendously. And and I think, uh, Dr. Lane, what you're hitting on, and Sean, what you said, it's not just the new third-party app developers where innovation is going to be happening. It's the threat of those third-party app developers disintermediating the established uh, application vendors or the payers or the providers, I think you're going to see a huge amount of innovation and digital transformation in the payer community and the provider community simply to keep the relationship with their members and their patients and prevent what Sean described. And that's equally exciting, if not more exciting, right? To see genuine digital transformation and consumer engagement being driven by a payer and a provider. I mean, that's wonderful stuff. And driven by patients saying, this, this app better meets my needs. You know, I can't figure that portal out. <laughs> yeah, right. I can figure this app out. It's providing me what I need now to manage my care. I'm going with it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we're going to, this conversation has been great. And we're going to turn it over to Stephen now to, to hear from the audience and see if we have any questions. We do have a couple of questions. Can you guys, you guys can see me, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, it comes from a researcher. She has been doing work um, on a data-driven standards-based system approach to COVID-19 data management. She says, my group recently published a paper on this topic in Learning Health Systems Journal, and we now have a great document that we would like to share with others. Does, do, the, do the panelists have any recommendations on the best way to communicate this body of work and this knowledge and who should we be communicating it to so that it gets mentioned? So I guess the larger question is what I, I would read that as, you know, what kind of groups could someone like this get involved with from your guys' perspective? I'll, I'll jump out quickly and say that there is a lot of interest in, in COVID-19 across the federal agencies. So I would recommend that this person find leadership within those various agencies, just present the paper. If it's, if it's got the providing the use that, the, that your person says, they'll pick up on it um, and look at it and, and use it. Um, sometimes Twitter is a good way to, to get that in front of people too. Perfect, thank you. Anybody else wanna chime in on that? I would say Amy too, uh, you know, you talk to uh, people in medical informatics, at one of their conferences that gets a lot of 
people to see something at once. Perfect. The uh, ONC also has an interoperability feedback portal that, uh, that can be used to submit information to them. And thank you, Dr. Lane. I think you just posted that in the chat. So everybody check out the attendee chat if you haven't already, because Dr. Lane actually shared one, two, three, four different items that are relevant to the conversation we've had today. Um, so the next question is actually from me. Um, and it's kind of, I wanted to direct it towards Sean. All right, get ready, Sean. No, I'm kidding. It's not gonna be that bad. Um, <laughs> we actually had the great fortune to have the chief informaticist for the Tennessee Department of Health uh, do a presentation with us back when we had a program virtually for our Nashville summit last year. And then most recently, we had a similar conversation with a woman who was in a similar role that works for the Florida Department of Health. And one of the things that came up in both of those conversations was they both um, really wanted to speak to our type of event or our type of group because hospitals were involved and they felt like hospitals didn't truly understand the plight of the public health data gatherers or really what the public health data gatherers needed from the hospitals um, so that they could be successful. So, I mean, I know Sean, and, and please feel free to tell me if you don't want to answer this question, but I think, you know, you're obviously passionate about this topic and I would, I would wanted to ask you from your perspective, what do you think hospitals should know about what the needs of the public health data collectors are and public health data managers? Oh, I mean, that's a great question. And, I, and I'd say that, you know, again, I go back to one of the things that we've identified here is the need for public health and healthcare to better collaborate, because it's pretty clear that right now the directionality of the data is to go from healthcare up to public health to populate the various public health registries. And that's one of the great kind of early and easy use cases, if you will, for an HIE is to populate and push that data. And that accumulates a lot of transactions, right? Um, the, the challenge is for the public health agencies now, not only to make use of that, but when they find gaps, how do they now collaborate with healthcare to actually find more value in that data? And we go back to that example of, well, if I'm getting uh, results data, but it doesn't have any contact information, that I can't really do my contact tracing capabilities. And that's a real um, unfortunate area. So I would just say that public health and healthcare do a great job of collaborating. They need to do a better job of digitally engaging with one another bi-directionally. And I think that takes an appreciation for um, the lack of funding in public health IT. And I think if we can up-level that ecosystem, and if we can then have them digitally connect for these kind of pressing use cases being born out of COVID, uh, I think we've got a path for something pretty great going forward. Yeah, and I would just add that the, the systems that are in public health are not meant to be bi-directional, right? That's a huge <laughs> right. leap to get them to that place. And that was played out with COVID and that sharing data back out of the system was not necessarily built inherently into any of these um, operating systems. So. That's still a challenge today and is, and is a direct result of that underfunding of public health infrastructure and data standards and requirements to be interoperable as well. Well, and to be clear, there's not a lot of appetite on the part of public health to make their data available. This has really been one of our challenges is that data gets reported up, whether it's lab data, whether it's immunization data, et cetera, and then providers and other stakeholders want to get a hold of that data and they can't. So we've had a lot of conversations, you know, in our region of trying to advance the public health infrastructure to support query by providers. And uh, the answer so far has been, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to that eventually. And I think that's the use case um, for HIE is to be that intermediary between the two organizations to ensure that the public health context is, is there and, and could be bi-directional um, and is where I see an accelerating component um, of HIEs for the future. Wonderful. Well, thank you. So that was it. Uh, let me just double check and make sure no other questions. There was coming. one more question, Stephen. Uh, in, it was in the question and answer about dental data. Oh, so yes. Can... Let me, sorry, I didn't see that because it was answered. So let me read this for you guys. It says, uh, dental data has been siloed from the rest of the health data ecosystem. We are beginning to see movement towards change, i.e. standards development and small interoperability pilots, but still lack regulatory and incentivization that medical... Um, still lack regulatory and incentivization. Thoughts on how we can bring this dental vendors, payers, providers into this conversation? 
And Dr. Lane, I know you responded in the chat that says, I suggest advocate for key dental data elements to be included in a future version of the use SCDI. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Maybe good to say that the, uh, we, we see that the federal government is expanding the reach of, uh, of the programs to include more and more, you know, more and more providers, more and more systems. It was just meaningful use with Medicare and Medicaid. As you look at the federal HIT strategic plans, they are saying we're going to go, we're going to spread it out among the federal programs. So just, I think that, I think the appreciation of the issue is there. You just have to get a foothold in, in somebody's office. And I think if dental programs become more a part of uh, value based care organizations, and I think it is in Medicaid, maybe. Uh, the more they're part of that, then the more they're going to want to measure, and then they're going to need uh, standard data elements to do that. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. That concludes all of the questions. Um, we really appreciate you being here today. And Dr. Lane, thanks for working with us on the fly. I'm glad we able to get you, or get you in old school. For those that don't know, my, my cell phone is sitting on top of my laptop. So that's how we've been listening to Dr. Lane, but it worked. Um, Thank you all again for joining us today for this session. Uh, thank you, of course, to our sponsors, um, Salesforce and MuleSoft and Informatica. Um, this conversation actually teed up the March 24th edition of the Digital Virtual Health Series perfectly. We're having an entire panel dedicated to social determinants of health in that program, so make sure you tune into that on March 24th. Uh, we're also tackling care management on March 24th, as well as a patient engagement panel panel that's titled Navigating the New Patient Experience, How You Can Build the Perfect Digital Front Door. So we're very excited to have that happen on March 21st. Thank you all again for joining us. And of course, all these sessions will be on demand. Everybody have a great afternoon and we'll see you next month. Thanks again, panel. Thank you, Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Thank you. Bye.